Consulting. SLR Consulting is a global uh, environmental consulting firm, um, and I specialize in underwater noise. Uh, my background is ocean engineering and a PhD in physical oceanography. So um, I spend a lot of my time putting different sound sources in different places around the world using different sound transmission loss models and also doing a little bit of um, uh, developing monitoring and mitigation plans. So uh, I'll be talking about some of that today. Yes, yeah, so I'm Mark Wood. I'm the founder of Ocean Sonics. I've been working in underwater sound for about two and a half, a little more than two and a half decades now. And so ocean noise is, is certainly an important part of, of uh, underwater sound. And one of the things we've noticed is that over the last probably five to 10 years, there's, there's a growing interest every year in uh, the effects of, of noise being produced by humans and what we can do to address that, that change in, in ocean sound. Thank you so much. So in the past 60 years, the noise in the ocean has become 10 times louder than it was. To set the scene a little bit, panelists, what is the state of underwater noise today? And Mark, maybe I'll start with you this time. Okay. Well, um, it's only been in the last 200 years that uh, uh, humans have been producing significant amounts of noise in the ocean and really just the last century where it's, it's been significant. And as Jennifer said, over the last uh, 50 or 60 years, it's gone up by 20 dB, about an order of magnitude. And so why is that important? It's important because of all the wildlife in the ocean. So uh, nearly every living thing in the sea depends on sounding one way or another in order to survive. And that's why sound is important. So before humans started making loud noises in the sea, the animals were able to navigate forage and communicate in, in, uh, in equilibrium in a way that they're used to doing it. But since we've uh, been increasing the amount of noise that goes in the ocean, we're, we're um, interfering with that, that balance that uh, has been taking place there. So what we want to do is, is find the right balance between human activities and our impact on, on the wildlife to ensure that they can still do, do those three things uh, going forward. Tim, what are your thoughts? Okay, well, over the last 60 years, I, I think quite, quite a bit has changed, and, and I'm not just talking about the, the density of, of commercial shipping activity. Um, I'm referring to all, all of the, uh, essentially all of the anthropogenic activities that, that happened um, in the marine environment. So small craft, um, seismic surveys, developing of new coastal infrastructure like terminals and uh, development of ports. So 
<clears throat> not only uh, are there more vessels out there that, that are larger and, and perhaps moving faster than they were 60 years ago, the accompanying and supporting activities around them are, are also happening at a much greater scale. Um, and, and that marine construction and, and seismic survey, offshore exploration aspect um, is, uh, I think, a big part of, of what has brought up um, some of the metrics, uh, in especially low frequency measurements of, of underwater noise around the world and how that's changed over the past decade. Uh, but certainly it's not just one factor, in, in my opinion. Many things have changed and, and continue to change um, on a yearly basis in, in terms of activities, the types of noise that are out there, um, and, uh, and the density of these different anthropogenic sources of underwater noise. Thanks. So the way I see it, and I, if I want an analogy, I would say the climate change and the global warming, for example, we tend to say we, we have one and a half degree of the last century, and that's basically the entire planet is warming up, ocean is warming up. That's one very good indices uh, to uh, represent this kind of increasing climate change. In fact, same thing for underwater noise. So what I think about is what's the spatial distribution of this increasing trend? And not every region is the same. How do we characterize the hot spot of different areas? And then if you look at the shipping lane, for example, they have all these tracks and then there's a lot of gaps. So obviously the sound noise it will be different from area to area. If you I live in Los Angeles for a long time, if you look at the port, just watching the trucks on the freeway, you see how much noise is near the port. So it's very inhomogeneous. So how do we characterize those and then to work with those uh, players and then try to uh, mitigate and reduce those noise. Thank you so much. So we are curious if all of you have this already vested interest in underwater noise. Um, what are you hearing? And this is a question to the audience, so feel free to just yell it out. Um, what are you hearing ways that you can reduce noise? Is this something that people are even talking about trying to do? Um, have you heard of any ways? Is it just something that we could do today? Any thoughts? This microphone works. <laughs> Take a guess. Yeah. <laughs> what are ways we could reduce the noise in our ocean? So uh, there's two I can think of. Uh, yeah. Well, you can just reduce the speed uh, of the vessel. So that's one thing. That's not always possible. Uh, the other uh, is captation. Uh, if you can find a way uh, to reduce the captation uh, around the propeller, uh, it might help uh, mm -hmm. to reduce uh, the, the emitted noise uh, of the vessel. <laughs> if you measure your vessel um, noise profile and determine where your majority of your noise is coming from, you can implement various measures to reduce it. Yeah, yeah thank you. Oh, I got one more. for the uh, Coast Guard's future offshore oceanographic science vessel, the Hudson replacement. We did some noise reduction measures into the design of the vessel. And we also have a, a self-monitoring microphone pickup that will you know, allow us to watch out and maybe see if anything has changed as a surprise and that would prompt us to rectify a new source of noise that we notice. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. when you think about the uh, maximum, uh, what, what is a big noise for the uh, ocean? And I think the, uh, one of the, uh, my English is not good. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. early. Yeah. I think the ocean explosion, or like a pile driving sound uh, uh, for the wind foam, yes, I think the, uh, there's a, a couple of uh, big uh, noise to uh, make impact for the ocean. But, uh, yes. I want to learn uh, about what is that, yes. The monitor. Yeah. yeah. The quantifier. <laughs> what? Great, thank you so much. And um, yeah, we really appreciate it. It's not a test, it was just out of curiosity of how, how many people are thinking about this, if you're doing this in your work, um, trying to find these ways of reducing underwater noise. And I liked how we brought up a couple of examples, so shipping, pile driving, 
um, your own smaller vessels, getting your vessel profile, all of that stuff um, is really exciting to hear that people are thinking about and doing. Um, any thoughts from the panelists, just based on what the audience, any reactions? Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd love to respond to some of those great comments. So <clears throat> I, I have sort of a tiered list on, on what we can do. Uh, just have to bring down some of these underwater noise levels and it, it matches a lot of comments that we just heard. So um, let's start with commercial vessels. Uh, I think the lowest hanging fruit there is to slow them down where possible, not always possible. Socioeconomic concerns, obviously, for tankers, things like pilots and escorts uh, where they're needed. <clears throat> However, um, it's one of the easiest things to implement, especially in a trial program. Um, number two, we can move the loudest vessels away from critical habitats, so lateral displacement programs um, been trialed and, and proven effective. Uh, again, not appropriate for all types of ships. Tugs can't always be laterally displaced. They have to go certain places to do certain jobs. Um, number three for commercial vessels is retrofitting and energy savings devices. So uh, things like optimized propellers, propeller boss captains, um, newer technologies that we're seeing, air lubrication systems that are still being evaluated for their potential for underwater noise reduction. And then <clears throat> I think what everyone would like to see is a new global fleet, a new fleet of ships built from scratch to be quiet as, as a priority. And, and that is obviously the biggest ask from, from anybody um, especially talking to, to ship and, and vessel owners and, and shipyards, and I think we're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, but uh, that's essentially what we can do for mitigating a, a moving source. Um, when we mentioned marine construction, marine construction can, in some scenarios, be easier because the source is stationary. So we can do things like we can drop bubble curtains uh, around pile driving activities or rigid abatement systems for um, offshore wind turbine installations. Very expensive, um, but they do work. So um, we're working at mitigating uh, underwater noise sources that some of them are moving very quickly. Uh, some of them are some of the loudest, uh, some of the loudest noises in the ocean, but stationary and being emitted repeatedly in the same area. Just follow up on the commercial vessels, so maybe there are low hanging fruit we can work with. Um, I've been trying to talk quite a few of the big shipping companies, and uh, as you know, it's really difficult to go through the, the chain, talk to the right people. And then finally, I realized one of my investors and then my cap table is well, on the shipping company. So I was able to reach out to them all the way to the president, the director of ESGs. Um, and turn out this not, may not be as bad as what you think. There's a lot of programs already in place uh, in California. There's a Blue Whale, Blue Sky initiative. Uh, basically, there are certain areas along the how many miles off the coast. Uh, if the ship slow down to 12 knots and 14 knots, and then you get different stars, and there's gold stars, silver stars, and brown stars. So they update those tables every year. I think the shipping company is really competing to be on the gold star. You don't want to be the silver side. So I think there's some some is incentive. We can do something like that. Port of San Diego also have this 20 mile initiative. They they call it noise reduction within 20 miles. And they, if the ship complying 85 percent of the time, and you get a sticker in the, by the port. So there's a lot of these incentive you can do. Uh, when I talked to recently to the shipping operator, and then turned out they have a lot of flexibility. You know, for example, one of the shipping route is my investor owned is from Singapore, San Francisco, take 40, 50 days. And then turned out they don't want to be too early because if you get there too early, truck is not ready, port is not ready. It's just you have to be there at the right time. So it turned out they have a lot of flexibility to, to, to control their speed if they know there's a certain area in the middle of the Pacific, they, they want to need to slow down, avoid ship drive, for example, or other, other activities, reduce noise. And they can have a lot of flexibility to, they, of course, they have to be there at some point. But that, you know, we talk about a significant speed reduction and noise reduction. And I'm just going to add a couple of points to what Justin has said, and, and that is that there, there's other areas of low-hanging fruit. So uh, one of them is to clean your vessel. Every time you take it out of the water, clean all the, the barnacles and, and gunge off the bottom of the ship, and your efficiency will likely go up. The other thing that doesn't get talked about a lot is, is educating the seafarers and, and the vessel operators. So they, they have a lot of priorities. Some of them are, are conflicting, and so the amount of noise that their vessels emit is pretty far down their priority list. So 
how do we make it a higher priority is, is by educating them. And also the, the IMO has done something really interesting in, in January of this year, they uh, issued a recommendation, it's one level below a directive I guess, where they, they want to tie the, the greenhouse gas emissions requirement with uh, vessel noise emissions. So there are some things you can do to make a vessel more efficient, but it also makes it noisier. So that they want the vessel operators to not do those things, but they want to do the things that, that reduce greenhouse gas emissions while also making the vessel quieter. And so air lubrication is a good example of that. Really efficient props is, is potentially another example of that cleaning your vessel is another one. And lining the hulls to make them quiet is another good example. Uh, I like uh, the comment that, that one person made about sticking a microphone in the hull so you, you know how much noise you're producing. And I think that's actually a really nice way to educate yourself about the performance of your vessel. Thank you so much. We're going to pivot a little bit and just learn about each of your work because um, I think it's very fascinating how it all comes together. Um, so Justin, we'll start with you. What type of adoption or implementation of underwater noise mitigation are you seeing with the organizations you work with? You have a, a big scope of, of customers and clients that you work with. Um, so how is it different? How is it similar? And what trends are you seeing? Maybe give us a little background on kind of how you work with them as a acoustics lead. Sure. So um, one of the um, fields of work that, that I pursue with SLR Consulting and Underwater Acoustics is um, helping energy companies, Shell, Total Energies, um, get permission to conduct their seismic surveys um, and vertical seismic profiling activities in new regions of the world. So that is, those types of activities are some of the loudest noises in the ocean um, and they are very difficult to mitigate. These are air guns of 250, 260 dB source levels for, for the array sometimes. Um, so in that case, the best that we can do there, because the surveys are going to move forward um, regardless, is, is to quantify the impacts and, and to show these are the exclusion zones, this is the range where you're going to cause permanent harm or temporary harm to different marine mammals based on their steering group. Um, and, and that's a major part of, of the work that I do is, is make sure that the, that the seismic surveys are going to happen uh, and not just happen, but then transition into the operational phase where they're going to you know, drill 70 wells in one location and pump oil for two years, that the noise levels are well understood and the impacts are at least appreciated, if not fully realized ahead of time. So um, when uh, we work in, in new areas um, where exploration is continuing, like off the coast of, of South Africa um, and also lots of, lots of regions in Australia, um, <clears throat> our mitigation approach is to bring the best practices in underwater acoustics to that region um, where it might not be already established uh, or part of uh, the country's normal way of operating and doing things because these, these are new activities. There's never been that many um, exploration vessels offshore looking for uh, new seismic blocks to explore. Um, so for that type of noise, and, and unfortunately the loudest noise, uh, one of the loudest noise sources in the ocean, um, right now we quantify and we are looking at what can replace these traditional surveys and traditional means of offshore construction. Instead of 30 air guns, can it be done with one optimized air gun that is more directional and uh, essentially causes less harm hundreds of kilometers away from, from the actual source of the survey. So. Um, we rec recognize at, at SLR that, that, again, these are essentially the underwater explosions that are happening thousands and thousands and thousands of times. Um, and we are certainly looking forward to a changeover from these traditional survey methods to companies that are willing to look at more optimized technologies, but it's an investment um, to move away from the, these traditional air guns and, and uh, essentially um, impulsive, uh, releasing impulsive sources of underwater noise over and over again. Uh, just to gather information. So uh, it's a little bit of a, a deep dive in, into uh, uh, seismic surveys that is uh, what I spent quite a bit of my time on and I have seen um, un unfortunately uh, uh, a move in both directions. Uh, a move for some companies to move to using smaller quieter optimized arrays in some regions of the world 
and another region for the world. Um, it's like one ship surveying, two, three, four ships surveying at the same time with multiple arrays firing, um, not simultaneously, but in a flip-flop flop pattern, uh, collecting a tremendous amount of information, but also releasing a tremendous amount of noise. I have a quick follow-up question on that too. So how are these different regions, um, like why are they coming to you? Are they being forced to through regulation or is it their own interest? Um, how are you kind of converting them to, to starting to monitor their underwater noise? What, what's forcing them to, to come to you or are you going reaching out to them? Um, so where we are working, uh, I mentioned that, that SLR has a global pre presence, so we have offices in, in, uh, in South Africa and in Europe and, and, and Australia. Um, and so, so these these energy companies are, are coming in from uh, different regions from around the world, identifying these seismic blocks and where they want to conduct surveys and um, a full um, environmental impact assessment mm -hmm. is, is required, not okay. just the underwater noise, but, but, but everything that they're planning on doing. And so um, the sound transmission loss uh, study that, that I conduct uh, becomes a part of that. Um, and then, then that will eventually end up in front of whatever country we're, we're talking about. So if I'm working with uh, Angola, if I'm working with Mozambique, that will end up um, eventually in front of the courts of, of that country um, okay. for review and um, uh, litigation um, and, and assessment to essentially see if they're happy with the work that has been conducted to date. Okay. Thanks, Justin. Sure. So another little bit of a pivot to, to Mark now. Um, so Mark is my boss, so a very intelligent person here. Um, and we, yeah, working at Ocean Sonics. So Justin talked a lot about monitoring um, that sound. You are the acoustic designer, the one creating those tools that Justin typically uses, um, actually does use in his work. Um, so how are you seeing the innovation of the technology that's actually recording this sound uh, move over time? What are you doing? How have your priorities shifted over the years um, as underwater noise has become more prevalent? And um, yeah, what are what's what innovation are you working on right now, and what are your priorities? Well, uh, we're we're constantly finding newer and better ways to, to measure noise. But I, I think that, that one thing is important is to understand why we're doing it. So imagine you go to a, a rock concert and you leave three minutes later, then you're talking to your friends with your normal tone of voice. Whereas if you stay all evening and you leave, you, you'll find that you're shouting at your friends. And the difference is that you've been exposed to more sound. So the sound exposure level is higher. And what's happened is, is your threshold of hearing is is changed you become slightly deaf and it's temporary and so this is the kind of thing that we need to understand for the, the wildlife in the sea and to find tools for making those kinds of measurements so SEL is, is one example of, of a, a really important measurement that's made in the sea there's other ones so if you're pile driving then obviously the, the impact energy is important as well you just need one of those ones and, and you, you could be suffering from permanent hearing damage or, or, or temporary damage. So uh, we've been making tools, uh, we, we make smart hydrophones, and the software that goes with those tools allows you to make SEL measurements. So they, they follow the, the calculations. There's a new standard out uh, called uh, ISO 17208, but basically it's, it's a recommendation, a standard for calculating those in a consistent way. So that gives you an apples to apples comparison of the sounds being produced. So if you measure your vessel one year and you measure it in a different place the next year, you're gonna get a, a nice consistent measurement of that kind of sound. So we, we uh, create the software, but also we create a solution. So you can have a, a buoy for your range or you can have a bottom mounted system. And um, by deploying it in, in the way that's recommended, you're making consistent measurements. And that's what's really important is to follow the, those standards, to follow those consistent measurements, to give you uh, good, reliable data that you can publish and, and people will trust. Uh, the other thing is is that, uh, I, I'm, I, again, I'm, I'm glad somebody mentioned about putting a hydrophone on, on the bottom of a vessel. It's one of the things we're looking at. How do we get an indication of a vessel that's underway? So if, if you're driving past a range, you're gonna get a nice, precise, um, standards reference indication of your sound. But if you have a hydrophone mounted somewhere in your hull, ideally near the propeller, 
then you can um, drive that past the range, know what that represents. And over time, if that reading changes, if it gets louder or if it, even if it gets quieter, then that's an indication that your underwater radiated noise from the vessel has changed. And so uh, that's like a proxy or a sentinel measurement. And I think that's a really interesting tool. And so we're looking at ways of, of, of trying to make a good sentinel measurement of vessels that are underway. And the nice thing about that is it's a real-time tool that the captain can now mitigate the amount of, of radiated noise they're putting into the water. Thanks, Mark. And up on the screen here, I know Mark can't really see it, but we do have a, a photo of the IC lesson hydrophone deployed over the dock down at the port of Halifax, um, and it's doing a real-time measurement. Um, Mark, why do you think that real-time is so important, just in, in this photo itself, but um, also what you mentioned with the decision-making? Like why, why does that make, I guess, the IC lesson kind of unique in that? in that sense with what this photo is showing. Sure, so th this is actually a screenshot from a video of a cruise ship going by. No, I'm sorry, not a cruise ship, just a large vessel. And you can see that there's a, a red part that gets louder as, you, as it goes to the right. So as the vessel goes past the, the hydrophone, you can see the sound level get greater. And so what it does is it shows you the impact of that vessel passing by. Mm -hmm. And uh, the nice thing about doing that in real time is, is that it doesn't take a lot of training. You don't need to be a rocket scientist to interpret that display to know that something's getting louder, even if you can't hear it yourself. So uh, if you can apply algorithms to this data, then you can do some really cool stuff. Oh. <clears throat> Let's add uh, one sort of connecting factor there between what Mark was talking about and actually what's up on the board there. So uh, Mark's measurements of, of SEL and, and, and source level those are the measurements that drive the models that I'm talking about that let us put sound anywhere in the world and assess the impact of it on the species that are there. So the cleaner those measurements, um, after a little bit of post-processing, um, that, that's what drives the entire uh, workflow that I was just talking about previously. It, it all sorts, start, starts with a clean measurement um, of the underwater noise activity. So you can see the slide, yeah. So um, we just talked a little bit about like more so the coastal um, regions of the ocean. Your work is mostly in the deepest parts of the ocean, but you'll talk later about how you are moving a bit more coastal. But what are the impacts of making noise in the deepest parts of the ocean and sure. how is your work in those areas going? Yeah, yeah, Justin mentioned earlier about the traditional way of uh, making sound and measuring sound and then Mark spent his two decades of career making hydrophones to detect the sound. You have to put a hydrophone somewhere. You can put it on the ships, and then you can put it in the ocean. I took a, a picture from this uh, NOAA website and then uh, highlight a number of different ways we are using today to, uh, to detect sound. You can use ships, you can use uh, bottom buoys, and then moorings, a variety of different autonomous systems, emerging gliders, for example. Uh, AUVs and um, a lot of these methods being used today and and that and that one of the questions uh, we bring to the table has been asking how do you apply this on the global scale if you monitor climate change you need a weather station everywhere on the planet you need to measure ocean warming everywhere in the ocean so one of the an analogy I would draw this particular Argo program the international Argo program some of you are familiar the bottom right panel showing the, the number of uh, profiling float we have today. It's almost approaching 4,000 of these reporting data every 10 days from surface to the 2,000 meters. So that's just characterizing how ocean is warming, give you not only the global number, you know, how many degrees per decade and per century, but also characterize the spatial distribution of the warming. And then turn out 2,000 meter warming is not sufficient. Now they develop the deep Argo. There's so-called heat leaking out from the upper ocean. So now try to me measure all the way to 4,000 or even 6,000 meters. So characterize the entire where the warming goes so you can close the budget to help developing better models to forecast in the future. And in this case, developing sound models. So the question that I've been working on the last 10 years or so is try to, how do we, putting hydrophones on every one of these floats. So then you get a real-time sound, uh, soundscape reporting 
every 100 miles, right? Or, or 200, 300 kilometers. So next slide uh, show you um, basically what we have been developing is in order, it's really go, but go down to the energy power consumption. Uh, the Argo flow power by batteries, they have CTDs, maybe oxygen, pH, as we are talking recently, adding more low power sensors, but there's no way to put hydrophones. They're gonna take, reduce the lifetime from three years to probably three months or something. Unless we see older magnet increase the budgeting, uh, funding our community, there's just no way have this Argo flow carry hydrophones. So, so the motivation is, uh, is coming, can we leveraging the, the clean renewable energy in the ocean? So we developed this technology, we can recharge the Argo flow battery by the ocean itself. Every time you come to the surface reporting data live, you go through this so-called thermal climb from cold to warm water, and we convert that temperature difference into electricity so we can recharge the battery. So that's extra energy allow us to carry hydrophones to detect sound. So we did a demonstration recently in Monterey, compare one of the cable hydrophones in Monterey Bay, and you see the float my engineer deployed is, uh, is my size, a little bit Skinner, and I have a hot, uh, Ocean Sonic IC Listen in there. And we deployed a couple times in Monterey, and then you see this uh, validation between Waterway here through a, a low cost autonomous system to a traditional cable power hydrophone. You hear blue whales in the 20 is 40 hertz, fin whales in the 20 hertz. You know, from experts' point of view, I asked the uh, Monterey expert, they cannot tell the difference. So we have a quiet platform. When we park at a couple hundred meters, we turn the hydrophone on, and we have onboard data processing. After energy limitation, we solve one of the biggest challenge, how to get the data out. We can mark and record, turn on the, the high sampling rate and then record gigabytes of data. How do you transmit through Iridium, and how do you pay for it, right? So we, um, we build a Linux computer program, allow users to write their C code and Python code in the lab, Basically, you order a $30 board to the desktop, they develop the, the program, and then we load into the floats before we deploy. Now you can log in to our float, compute, detect, compute the spectrogram, reporting real-time data. 1% of the data transmit, do you have a whale neighborhood to tell the shipping company to slow down? So that's where we have been doing, hopefully there's one potential opportunity to deploy on the global scale. Thanks, Yi. And, and just a quick follow up to that. So, you was the hydrophone one of the first sensors that you put on your platform? Um, we put in uh, the traditional oceanographic sensors before yeah. with the CTD measure temperature salinity. That's probably the first uh, mm -hmm. no brainer to start. Yeah. And then eventually we put in more chemistry, bio geochemistry, like mm -hmm. oxygen, nitrate, and pH. And, Iridians and things like that. Yeah. So we're moving from the physics to kind of biogeochemistry, mm -hmm. and a hydrophone is the next natural sensor to get to the soundscape monitoring. And we are putting, develop, working with the, the active acoustic community as well to develop echo sounders. So you can either profile velocity like ADCP or mapping seabed, looking down, and potentially you can look on the side to to echo the plankton population or something. So the platform offer, once we solve the energy problem, it opened up a whole range of application opportunities. So I'm gonna turn it back to the audience. Um, curious if you have any thoughts or questions. Um, it could be about what the panelists have just said or anything that's lingering on your mind in general. Feel free to raise your hand. Mike runner. I can run it here. I got it. I got it. Okay. I got it. You, you moderate. Yeah, I'm Bruno from Singapore. Um, I work uh, in underwater acoustics at the National University of Singapore. And I'm also here because I'm deeply for oceans. Um, so, is there any um, database where you really measure the sound and then calculate the impact of that sound on the marine biodiversity? Because there are different types of noise, right? So how do you isolate specifically radiated noise from the ship? How does it impact? What is frequency dependent? What is phase dependence? That's one question. And second one is, uh, you said uh, slow down the traffic to reduce the noise. But it's also possible that continuous 
exposure to see whether law and order is not can still have some impact on the life cycle. Because when you move faster, the amount of time you are exposed is less, but you get a higher number of but when you move slower, you're continuously getting it maybe certain frequencies, for example, the exposure increases. So as the uh, any study So to answer the second question first, uh, there have been some studies done on it, and it turns out that the sound intensity uh, grows exponentially, whereas if you slow down the vessel, it's linear. And so for that one reason, and this has been modeled, that uh, in, in nearly all cases, there is a significant benefit to slowing down the vessels, even though the exposure is, is longer. Um, the, the relationship between the length of time and the shift in sound intensity it favors slowing the vessel down. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I, I can add a little bit to that in that um, when we perform the <clears throat> type of modeling assessments that I was discussing, um, we usually lean towards a, a conservative or worst case exposure scenario. So for example, that would be a marine mammal that instead of being um, disturbed and flees the area uh, after an acoustic disturbance, um, instead it, it stays in the area and follows the ship or stays in close proximity to the pile driving. So if there's going to be 12 hours of pile driving activity, we will generally assess 12 hours of impacts on those different hearing groups and the different marine mammals. So um, <laughs> it's, it, it is always a question um, of uh, what the marine animal is going to do after it has been exposed to noise and that's actually a whole nother layer of, of modeling on, on top of what I've been talking about which is animat or behavioral response modeling and, and kind of follows um, the work that I do um, but we generally lean towards um, the conservative or, or worst case exposure scenario um, just to be safe to, to, to ensure that we understand the impacts of the amount of time that that energy is, is being released into the ocean Follow up with those question, maybe Justin, Mark, have an answer. Uh, talk about uh, the climatology. As an oceanographer, we work with temperature salinity. There's a co compilation of all the, the historical data, and then the, there's a climatology map, and then the chemi biogeochemistry community also have a global oxygen climatology. Is there similar type of database of a sound? This is kind of climatology kind of database or historical database? Sorry, in terms of an actual widely accessible acoustic yeah. database, yeah. I don't think that there is one that's comprehensive or, or, or really widely available right now. I think there's a lot of different parties monitoring that retain their own data or release select portions of that data. And I hope that's what we're moving towards in the future is more of a global database of, of underwater acoustic records instead of more of a piecemeal distribution of those records and the results. Well, in the U.S., is now own that database, and is there a natural owner for that? Who, who, which particular agency or group potentially were owned and sponsored this kind of database? I actually don't know federally who dictates uh, who NOAA and NIMS distributes data to. Um, I can tell you that in Canada, um, it's a complicated uh, procedure to get uh, underwater acoustic data recordings released just because you are interested in looking at them. Um, there usually has to be some driving factor uh, behind it or some prior authorization or involvement in the project to get access to that data. Um, and that's, I guess, the current current state of things right now. Um, I'm hoping accessibility improves for, for, for everybody, not, not just scientists, but also the, the general public. Right. So I just want to follow up on that, and that is that Justin's right, there is no good database of, of uh, underwater sounds and, and classification. But there are some um, good efforts. So uh, GOOS, Global Ocean Observatory System, and there, there is, uh, I think it's called OOI, the Ocean Observatory Initiative in the US, and in Canada it's called Ocean Networks Canada. And so these are public databases of, of ocean observed data. And uh, it is possible to get access to the data. And sometimes it's actually well annotated uh, the, the ONC one, Ocean Networks Canada one, is they, they've done a, a pretty good job of annotating that data. The US is it's a work in progress, and there's some European ones as well where 
um, the, the data is, is, it's been probably processed and if you find the right person, they'll let you access it. So in other words, it, it does feel kind of ad hoc. Uh, there are also some, some nice uh, papers that have been published. So Jennifer Mixisoltz is a good example of, of uh, one of the researchers uh, working with a few others who's published uh, some nice categorizations, categorizations of, of ocean sounds done mainly in, in the open ocean. So in the middle of the Atlantic, using the, um, uh, what's it, it's the ballistic missile testing uh, hydrophones and also in the, in the Pacific. So she's done some amazing work with analyzing the soundscapes and categorizing them over long periods of time, like 20 years. So it's an amazing um, analysis of the data. So it sounds like there's a need for it, even though it's, it's, it's a lot scope. Today. Yeah. It's challenging, I know. Yeah, there, there's definitely a, a need, and just to add one, one more complicating factor to that, sometimes uh, these recordings can contain sensitive information, whether that's recordings of military activity or recordings of just very accurate source levels from a commercial ship that that vessel owner may not want being made public. Um, so that is an additional complicating factor um, when releasing acoustic information. Is there anything in there that somebody might um, object to, especially if it's their property or business that, that's being recorded? So there is some sensitivity there as well. Well, that's pretty common. I was talking to CBET 2030. I don't know what many of you are familiar with CBET 2030, but you met the CBET. They convinced all the previous data collectors released the data from oil companies from shipping survey companies and sometimes military operations. And then sometimes even illegal activities, someone go to other people's EEZ mapping seabed without permitting. And then you certainly don't want to release that data who, who own it. So there's a way to get around that you can, you can make it anonymous, you can degrade the data. There are ways to, 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 to protect that source of the information, make the data available. So there's there's a lot of value to have a public accessible database, even though it has some compromises. Yep, that's it. There is an organization that's actually working on that, the International Quiet Ocean Experiment, or QOE. And uh, I don't know how successful they've been. I know it's, it's a little bit like nailing jelly to the wall, trying to get these data sets coordinated, and also they're, they're disparate. They, they, don't, they don't match each other very well. And also, if, if you have good communication with, with your, your partners in the, in the region and, and, and their vessels, you can redact certain things from the overall acoustic record and, and not significantly impact your baseline readings or, or um, you, you can pull out the sensitive bits and, and still retain the most important parts of the record. Hi, uh, this is Tamira from Safe Harbors. Um, thank you so much for providing this information. It's fantastic to know what's happening uh, for the underwater sounds. Um, so, I, if I understand it correctly, um, in terms of the classifications and finding out, because underwater sounds um, quite broad, like when you are having dropping off the hydrophones and or collecting information under the sound, there's could be a massive number of different things sounds that you hear. So, if I understand it correctly, there's no specific data that classify what that sounds about, right? If it's a you know, it could be a drilling sound, it could be a like, ship sound, it could be uh, a mammals. I mean, mammals are very, I know, distinct, and they have been done a fantastic job finding out about is the whales, is it the orcas, or is what kind of basically mammal is making that sound. So that is kind of, I know that it's been out there, but from my understanding, there's not a specific classification of how that sounds is, what is belonged to, um, is that correct? Uh, or do you need, if there is a research has been done to classify them, to actually find out what sound is, is what it is? Is it the ship? Is it the barge? Is it, um, so that's kind of want to understand that if that has been done any research on it or yes. any technology that. So uh, I think a tremendous amount of research has been done um, and a lot of excellent peer reviewed papers have been published and a lot of excellent technical reports from companies like the SLR and companies like JASCO uh, have, uh, have been published. And to be honest, if I'm looking for verification of how loud drilling is or how loud pile driving is, I'm <clears throat> the first place I'm going is to one of those peer-reviewed papers or uh, technical reports uh, to look for a spectrum of measurements or what was used in, in modeling and, and where that came from. So mm -hmm. um, it can often be a bit of a treasure hunt to, uh, to find the original source of, of that data and if it stemmed from a measurement or, or an estimate. Uh, but there is quite a bit out there that has been published and, and 
excellent re research spanning the last 40, 50 years. But this data has been, it be, let's say somebody that wanted to access those data and trying to find out, you know, it's, um, it's what that's- as easy as it could be. Uh, it, it might involve me digitizing a plot that somebody uh, made uh, 20 years ago from a measurement that was conducted 30 years ago. So there's those sort of accessibility right. problems. Ideally, one day we can all go to a website, um, you know, uh, put in whatever source of underwater noise that we want and get a couple accurate estimates of what that sounds like in different places around the world. But we're, mm -hmm. we're working towards that, I think. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so it's going to confirm that. So that there's no specific if I'm just trying to make a simple version of it. So there's no specific um, data that's actually telling you if the sound that is coming in or classify the sound that's coming in, is it the ship or is it the, the you know, sounds from the mammal? So there's no sort oh, we, of classification we, there. Yes, we can certainly tell that. The distinction between noise from a ship, a vocalization from a marine mammal, um, what noise from pile driving stuff, that type of classification is, is well advanced okay. at, at this point. So there's little, um, certainly when there's a lot, of, a lot of those sources happening at the same time, there can be some ambiguity in separating them. Okay. Um, but recognize, recognizing them at this point, I don't think is, is the main challenge. It's okay. properly measuring them. Okay, yeah. perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. And then you see more papers that, that I've been reading recent papers talk about detecting sound coming from the rain. So you can, if you, if you park the hydrophone, at 10 meter or 100 meter below, you can hear how strong the wind blows and then how, how, how heavy the raindrop on the surface. So there are more and more peer reviewed papers talk about detecting different phenomena, but I, but the, I don't think the data behind it can be easily accessible, except just as Justin said, it's a peer review result, right? So there's no public saying, if I upload this sound, and all the 20 different sources come out so chat GPT probably not smart enough to, to help you. Hi, um, Michael Buckman next from Environment Climate Change Canada. Um, I just have two questions if that's okay. Uh, my first is on active noise canceling. I know like headphone technology recently has been able to have active noise canceling by almost like emitting like a, a counter sound frequency to cancel out uh, noise around you. Is that type of technology even possible for underwater noise or does the physics just not uh, make sense? Um, my second question um, is just on, uh, is there any data on battery electric um, ships or hydrogen power ships and how the underwater noise, it, if that's uh, improved in those cases or even worse? or if it just comes down to like the propeller in the water. Uh, thank you. Shall I go first? <laughs> yeah, so I, uh, I'm, uh, okay. I'm answer the second so, question. Yeah, so noise cancellation, it works it in one place. So your ears, they're, they're in a fixed position relative to the headphones. And so they, they cancel the noise at one place. The problem with doing noise cancellation in the open water is that you're doing it in a huge volume of space. So you can, you can do noise cancellation in one place, but then other areas around it, you might actually make it worse because you get this kind of uh, um, modal effect that, that takes place. So that's, that's why you don't see sound cancellation being used. But uh, um, with uh, some construction sites, they're looking at using Helmholtz resonators, which kind of sort of do the same thing. And that is that it's a wall with all these cavities and as sound enters them, they resonate inside of them. So they, they, it's kind of the same thing, but different. But it means on the other side of the resonators, there's significantly less sound. And to me, that makes a lot more sense because what you're doing is, is you're capturing the sound and, and parking it in, in a small volume, converting it into heat, rather than trying to cancel it out. Thanks, Mark. Um, the second question was uh, high professors. I can talk a little bit um, about that. So um, the primary source of underwater noise from a vessel is of course going to be the propeller in the water. Um, when we drive that by a different means, so if we, instead of using diesel, uh, if we use battery power or, or LNG, um, we're changing some of the secondary sources of, of underwater noise. That propeller is, is still spinning, um, probably just as fast. Um, 
but initial evidence, and, and these it's initial evidence because these vessels are sort of trickling out um, onto the scene, mostly in the form of um, medium-sized ferries, because that's about what we have the technology to um, quickly power and, and charge. Initial evidence suggests that these vessels are going to be wider than, than a, a, a traditional um, uh, diesel electric or diesel plant. Uh, but but it, again, it, it is initial. Um, we don't have a lot of um, full-size electric container ships transiting the oceans. M maybe we never will because at some point you're just shipping batteries back and forth across the ocean instead of actually moving anything meaningful. Um, but that's where we get into alternate forms of propulsion, wind-assisted propulsion, um, other things that we, we can do um, to move, move away from the tr traditional means of propulsion that have been basically dominating the global soundscape for a hundred years. Do you see jet propulsion as a replacement for the normally normal propeller driven? Uh, jet driven propulsion? Yeah. yeah. Um, un uncertain um, because again it's still a the main source of propulsion is, is still very much in the water column, so we're still injecting that noise essentially right where the propeller is. Um, what can be very interesting in terms of underwater noise, and some people might argue that I'm just shifting noise from one environment to another, um, are hovercraft. Um, as of when a hovercraft goes by an underwater listening station, it is barely detectable. Yeah. So um, again, not suitable for all purposes, but an interesting application. Hi guys, uh, my name is Matt Goche, I work for Defense Research and Development Canada. This question has got me thinking on the recent IMO guidelines for the reduction of URN, specifically the energy efficiency indices. I think there are indices for existing ships and new design ships, so I'm curious in your thoughts on, on these indices, indices and their, their effectiveness, I guess, in perhaps driving the innovation. <clears throat> so, uh, in, in energy savings devices and, and improving the efficiency of, uh, of commercial vessels or any type of vessel is always a step in the right direction when we're talking about underwater noise. Um, it, it's always a step in the right direction, but it's not always a net reduction in underwater noise. It, it generally is, and I would always make that argument that increasing efficiency means that you're keeping wasted energy from leaving your system and, and entering the water, uh, but I have seen um, energy savings devices that uh, increase vessel efficiency, but increase underwater radiation noise. And maybe that's because the propeller is biting harder or some part of the flow dynamics, or I mean, we're getting into some naval ar architecture topics here. Um, but yes, in general, I, I agree that increasing vessel efficiency should have a corresponding um, influence on bringing down underwater radiation noise. It's just not completely cut dry. And that's, that's what that recommendation is all about that you just mentioned. Um, one of the big challenges that came from that, and there's, there's a paper published that was written by Southampton University, and they said that right now, uh, the, the challenge is understanding the relationship between reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the impact on, on underwater radiated noise. So where's low hanging fruit? We don't actually know uh, very well today what the answer to that question is. So the, the focus should be on, on, on finding that linkage. So like Justin said, making a propeller more efficient doesn't necessarily buy you anything. Whereas, you know, adding wind assist is, is a really powerful way of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The propeller is not working as hard now, so it, it's going to, to make the emissions quieter. Um, but again, we don't have, there's, there's been very little research done on it. We don't have those, those insights that we need to make good decisions. And just to add to that, one, one of the reasons that we don't have a lot of information about the effectiveness of this device is that these devices, that it's very hard to get a full-size commercial vessel out, trial it, measure it before it's been retrofit, and then get it back out and measure it again under essentially the same conditions. So you have a before and after. These are working vessels and they're only like keep them working. And, and that's essentially how it goes. Most, I, I think most, most is fair, most, Measurements of commercial vessels, source level measurements are opportunistic measurements as the vessels are going by in the commercial traffic lanes, unless separate trials have been set up um, to classify the ship as, as quiet at, at a testing range or, or something along those lines. Now, DRDC has a vessel they want to lend us for a few months. <laughs> we got our own problem. <laughs>
I appreciate you bringing that up because it, it led exactly into the next question that we did have for Mark, which he touched on, um, which was the relationship between greenhouse gases and underwater radiated noise. We had that written in our session description and something that we've been thinking a lot about at Ocean Sonics. But um, Mark, do you think that bringing those two things together will actually speed up, if we're talking about regulations, speed up regulations on underwater radiated noise if they pair it with greenhouse gases? Um, or should it be its own thing? What are your thoughts a little bit further on that? I think what it's going to do, if we're successful, is it's going to have us do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's important. And that's that's why I'm I'm really in favor of this recommendation. The other thing is it's doing is it's getting designers, uh, naval architects, people who are, are doing uh, the right things with the vessels, vessel owner operators, uh, to get them thinking in the right way about reducing greenhouse gases while reducing underwater radiated noise. So awareness is the biggest challenge, understanding, uh, you know, doing the research and that kind of thing, and then getting the designers the tools they need to do those designs. And what is that right way? That's the big question. <laughs> <laughs> Next year, maybe we'll have some more information. About that. <laughs> So Justin, you touched on this a little bit. You do have a global perspective of what's going on in the underwater noise um, sector. Europe seems to be leading the way by implementing these measures on underwater radiated noise. Do we want to replicate what they're doing? Do we like what they're doing? It's being from a Canadian perspective. Um, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? I think there, there's, there's a couple different ways to define leading the way, whether that's uh, the amount of data that you collect, the number of hydrophones in the water, the number of reports that are, that are processed, or, or even the number of mitigation programs that, that are, are, are put into practice. So I think um, for some perspective, I think here on, on both the east and, and west coast of Canada, we have some nice slowdown programs that, that are happening for vessels coming into the Salish Sea, uh, or to the St. Lawrence Seaway. So that's, uh, I think that's an excellent example of Canada leading the way um, or doing their best to lead the way in that regard. Certainly um, uh, places like Europe may have more hydrophones in the water, um, but uh, I, I think it comes down to a, a matter of maybe personal opinion and interpretation on what is being done with that data. Uh, there are advantages to all the things that I, I, I mentioned, uh, collecting large amounts of data, processing that data, um, putting in monitoring and mitigation plans. Um, all of these things matter. Uh, they just might matter differently in different parts of the world. So I, I think uh, here in Canada, we're doing an excellent job at, at leading the way in trialing and instituting um, some of the ease, more easily accessible uh, mitigation programs that I, I discussed, just slowing down vessels and, and lateral displacements. And perhaps we could be doing a little bit better in terms of our uh, spatial coverage uh, of our hydrophone network, but we do have the BC Hydrophone uh, network that is expanding, and uh, perhaps we need to expand a little bit more um, on, on the East Coast in terms of the coverage of, of our hydrophones. Just gonna add one thing really quickly to that, and that is in Europe, as far as I know, they don't have the same kind of uh, slowdown zones that we do here, but there has been talk of them having a certificate of, of of you are in compliance with vessels. And if you don't have that, then there's some ports that you can't go in. And so that's a really compelling um, incentive for vessel operators to either um, get certified or to build new vessels. Even initiatives like Green Marine. I know Justin, you attended Green Marine, uh, Green Check this year. And there is one of the, the, the categories is underwater noise being able to monitor that um, and reduce that in order to get that standard. Are you seeing more standards coming up around North America? Um, we are seeing wider adoption of the underwater noise performance indicator uh, amongst members of Green Marine. Um, and, and for anyone uh, who doesn't know, Green Marine is, is a network of, uh, of ports, terminals, uh, ship owners um, across North America. And it's also a, a Green Marine Europe, I believe. Um, and uh, Green Marine has, I think, 15 or 16 performance indicators and many, many new ports and uh, ship owners and terminals joining on a monthly basis and adopting these performance indicators. So 
the climb is from one to five. One is acknowledging that issues in underwater noise exist. Um, five can involve implementation of multi-million dollar monitoring and mitigation programs. So it, it, it can be a steep hill to climb for new port authorities, or, sorry, port authorities that are new to the world of uh, uh, impact of underwater noise. Uh, but the Green Marine Program um, is an excellent guide and I think stepping stone to um, better monitoring um, and, and better, better compliance with some of these recommended mitigation measures. <coughs> I'm going to go back to you now, and um, I'm curious to, to talk about the difference between the deep water and the coastal areas measuring. I think we have a lot of information about our coastal areas, even starting to learn more about our port areas. Um, how does the knowledge between what we know about the deeper areas and noise in the ocean versus the coastal areas differ? Uh, is there a difference? Is there more knowledge in, in both of those spaces? Yeah, there are, those are the graph and then two of the citations we are working on. One is on the more uh, open water, deep, blue, blue water, deep ocean on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we work with the Port of San Diego Coast Guard for the security. You try to put in a few fixed location uh, hydrophones and kind of with our surface expression. So we, we reduce the cost of maintenance compared to the moorings but also uh, reporting data real time. So uh, those are the key uh, ingredient of the technology we bring to the table. Mark talked about uh, real time data decision making. It's critical not only have the, the, the database, we know kind of uh, on the average uh, sense where the, or the noise, dis spatial distribution of the noise, but also reporting how different this year or this particular day, or the, there's maybe illegal traffic across the border of San Diego or something and the Coast Guard need to know. Um, so those are the real time reporting. Uh, the technology we bring to the table is how do we get the, the, the detection all the way to information, like uh, the question you ask, and uh, not only for researchers, for peer review papers, but uh, for decision makers. The Coast Guard pilot, for example, doesn't really have Python code to run doesn't have access, doesn't have time to access the cloud to, to process the gigabytes of data and the marks hydrophone recorded. So how do you automatically process them for decision makers who only have a few minutes to, to, to make a decision and that doesn't have years of research or write a paper. So how do you do onboard data processing report even, even the red light, a yellow light, a green light, you know, something going on so I can send a helicopter to check it out. So those kind of the real-time data processing, real-time decision making, you know, something like a lot of the other disciplines, you know, collect data, the AI is a big thing today, you know, a lot of the model getting smarter and how do we report those information so we can enable better decision making. So those are the areas that we're working on, not only challenging collecting data, but also more importantly, processing of the data. Establishing the database is the key so you can train AI to, to process the data, uh, better characterize what sources. And then the final audience I don't think we touch on today is the general public. And then, you know, if you take a lesson on climate change, you have to communicate this to general public. The kids of Oklahoma doesn't have a luxury to, to visiting SeaWorld, you know, and, uh, in San Diego to, to, to see the whales. And then, but if they can listen online, they can appreciate the noise in the ocean and they can tell their parents and their parents can, can vote election year. Mm -hmm. So make a difference and then maybe bring more new funding to our community. So that kind of loop, we need to do a better job to what they call a K to grade, the kindergarten all the way to retired people, you know? Mm -hmm. So how do you deliver that data to that audience who have no knowledge of oceanography and acoustic data processing? So those are the things that come to my mind and deliver that kind of real time data live to those audience and then eventually help our research and then help our field. And a, a question just for all of you, have you seen in the in the community, have you seen underwater noise become more popular or more of a topic that people are interested in and want to learn more about um, over your years of, of working in it? Any mark? I would say in general, there hasn't been a, a huge mm -hmm. surge of, of interest in, in um, 
effects of noise and, and sounds in the ocean. I, I think there, there's a greater interest in, in the wildlife in the sea than there was certainly when I was a young person. So the whales and, and other creatures that live in the sea. There is a, a really nice online resource called Dossets. And so if, if you're new to underwater sound, discovery of underwater sound in the sea, I think is what it stands for, Dossets.org. And it's, it's um, curated by, by professionals, uh, but it's written for students, for kids, and also for, for adults who want to learn more about noise. And, and there are some classifications there as well. So uh, I still enjoy going there, even though I've been working on underwater sound most of my career. So it, it, is, it is a nice uh, kind of open resource. So it, it'd be nice to see more of those types of things available for, for young people to learn about underwater sound. Um, uh, Dossets is, is, is a great uh, a great resource. There's some excellent uh, spectrograms and, and recordings of, of different typical types of uh, underwater noise that are available on that website, and, and that's a resource that I um, I think is a great model for the kind of openness that we're hoping for in, in, in the future. So, uh, if, if you ha haven't had the opportunity to go to the Dossets website, I, I encourage you to check that out. Um, the information that's on there and maybe think a little bit about what that might look like um, with 10 years more development and, and data behind it. I think we have a much easier problem. I, I have a PhD oceanography, always hard to explain to my family what I'm doing. You know, um, I, and also I've been spent 20, 30 years doing research, delivering data, the temperature salinity, and then I have a hard time to explain how, how important salinity is. Right, so and then I work on the seabed mapping, and they say, "Who care about the seabed? You know, why do we care? We don't live in the seabed." And then maybe DRDC care about seabed warfare now, but um, but I think the sound when when I started working on the acoustic a couple of years ago and it's new for me, it's so easy to explain. You know, and grandma, and my neighbors, you know, oh, I can hear whales, right? You tell me, is that blue whale, or fin whale, or humpback whales, right? So people get excited. So we, I, I think we should take from, we should appreciate this is a really easy problem to communicate and then much easier than many other abstract disciplines. And I told, you know, the main people, you can hear the wind, can you hear the wind? Can you hear the rain? Mm -hmm. So those, the simple things like that fascinate people. So I think uh, we have a much easier problem than many other. Who care about, you know, it's, it's hard to explain 1.5 degree in the century. How do you visualize that, right? For the sound, 10 times louder. That's such a powerful, I think we should take advantage of this field and then make it happen. Just add one, one more thing to that. Um, I, I, uh, mirror the comments of my colleagues here that my family also doesn't understand what I do um, in my work. Um, <coughs> I think a major difference between today and perhaps 10 years ago, and this is very promising, is that I get a lot more questions about underwater noise from people outside of the field of underwater noise. And 10 years ago, that was not really something that, that was happening. If I was talking about underwater noise, it would be with someone who was probably working on the model or working on the exact same project that I was working on. Now, I'm working with ecologists. I'm, I'm working with people who um, uh, do a lot more work on uh, coastal contaminated sites. There's the fields are sort of starting to overlap a little bit more as people learn more about um, underwater noise and the impacts on everything in the water column. So uh, that to me is, is a very encouraging change um, and, and something that uh, I think is driving forward additional change because more people are asking more questions about these topics. Thank you. We do have another period for any type of last comments or questions. Um, before we go to some final thoughts from our panelists. Hi, thank you very much for the panel. I, I had a question uh, about green green marine and wondering, you know, how are the, the, the port operators, how they're getting incentivized to adopt, you know, the, the acoustic measurement to, to increase their, their level of, of monitoring underwater radiant noise and you know, what, what's motivating them? We're incentivizing them to put that investment into, you know, putting that equipment into the into the ports. Thank you. So uh, I can talk a little bit about that 
Um, primarily, the incentive for ports and ship owners is the benefits of participating from a uh, public relations and uh, community involvement standpoint, saying we are looking at all these 15 or 16 different environmental uh, indicators and performance issues at our port, and, and we're um, actively addressing them. Um, there's trickle-down benefits to, say, port tenants and vessels that are coming into the ports. If, say, a port is able to um, establish, well, I'll use the Port of Vancouver as an example. If you have a quiet vessel, a vessel that's been certified as quiet, and you come into the Port of Vancouver, your vessel pays less to dock there. And, and that's a great program. Um, it's not a tremendous reduction in berthing fees, but it is a reduction in berthing fees. So that is how the Green Marine program introduces sort of trickle down beneficial effects. It starts high level with the port doing it so they can show the community um, and the government that they're participating and then um, generally the people that are working with them can benefit from those improvements. And just want to add one more thing to it. Uh, we have a client that's that's uh, getting Green Marine certification and their motivation is, is uh, pretty simple. They have a client who requires that they be minimum level three on all the indicators in order for them to do business with them. So in that case, there's a huge uh, motivation there. And, uh, and those certifications, um, they, they aren't just tokens, uh, certifications, they are independently audited uh, by people who did not conduct a study or did not conduct or prepare the monitoring plan for that entity. So on a yearly basis, these ratings are evaluated and audited to make sure that uh, the actual work is being done. So Justin, you mentioned about um, seismic surveying, so the explosive source, which is 250 feet. Do you see with the technology like autonomous underwater vehicles, because one of the reasons why they need such a high source level is that operating from the surface needs to go down, pierce the seabed. If you operate much closer to the seabed, for example, you don't have to use such a huge source to um, some source. So, do you see a fleet of AUVs instead I mean, using a tow array with this lower sound source doing some sort of uh, mapping or surveying? So um, you can already get an, an AUV out there with a sub bottom profiler on it and, and get, uh, get some bottom information. Unfortunately, the information that they're looking for from these seismic surveys are significantly deeper than what you're going to get from a sub bottom profiler, which requires a tremendous amount of energy, which most AUVs are not able provide at this point in time. So there's the amount of energy required to get the information that these oil companies are looking for to penetrate you know, 2,000 meters down into the sediments uh, is not something I see an AUV pulling around in the next five years, but certainly it's probably on the roadmap. And, and then that, as I mentioned, there's um, alternatives uh, uh, in the work here, replacing massive arrays with single gun arrays that, that can do the job. And maybe that's something more suitable for a remotely operated vehicle or ATV. Thank you for the question. Yeah. You could just shout it out. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, I, I just thought of something. Um, some of those some of those surface vehicles, the ASV, they could be really loud. And it's starting to, are people starting to consider like using the autonomous vessels, you know, what are, what are requirements for, uh, you know, goals for keeping the, the radiated noise from those ASVs down as well, and if people start to talk or think about that. I don't think we think about that. I can comment on a little bit of that. Sorry, are you referring to um, the airborne noise that's coming from some of these vessels, or the actual under pattern? Just, just, yeah, because like sometimes like they start moving the rudders, and yes. those are producing quite a lot of uh, acoustic noise underwater. Yeah, so, so um, those, the noise from those type of platforms are, are going to be similar in nature to the noise that we're starting to see from some of these hybrid electric smaller ferry designs, and, and I think would trend in, in that direction of, of being um, somewhat quieter, uh, but not in, in, in entirely removing the problem of underwater noise uh, until we find a better means for the propeller to move us through the water efficiently. Um, as for information that's been collected on unmanned vessels and the noise from them, 
pretty limited at, at this point because again probably trickling out at an even slower rate than these new hybrid uh, electric vessel designs so you can see like sometimes they'll move actuators and you'll get like 150 160 dB you know, you know very impulsive oh yes I, I, I've seen them um, uh, spin up their props for uh, maneuvers and, and things like that and, and certainly they can create a a knuckle in the water, if you will, to, to make that turn to demonstrate the manu maneuverability of the craft if yeah. they need to, right? So um, I, I think they can be quiet, um, but you can also drive them around at higher speeds. I think that's an interesting question because the future is moving towards swarming. So a lot of the surface vehicle, underwater vehicles in the future are going to be and hundreds, even thousands, we talk about that our DRDC colleagues and certainly US Navy thinking about swarming in the future. And then if you if you watch one of the light shows of the drones and then you enjoy it as a as a it's a show, right? So in the future, either for research or, or military or other industry purposes, you're gonna see swarming of these hundreds of even thousands of these vehicles and then they probably generate noise never people never thought about it. So that's a really great question. I think we need to follow up. If one of those, how much noise it could create. You don't have to worry about that. We have hundreds. <laughs> sure. Yeah, we have the, plat the quietest platform. So, but it's a very great, a good question to think about. If you have a swarming of 100 ASVs, what noise can we generate? listening to a presentation last year in Ottawa and uh, there was a lot of information about uh, noise actually generated from the ship's bodies because of all these little barnacles and stuff stuck to it. So what is the proportion between uh, noise generated from propulsion versus uh, fouling? And do we, need, we really need to attack both of them? Uh, yes, certainly we should attack bo uh, both of them. Um, I'm always going to say that a, a cleaner hull uh, or a hull with a coating is going to be beneficial. Um, but um, some, some studies that were by uh, uh, JASCO Applied Sciences in cooperation uh, with the Port of Vancouver, uh, looking at all the design and operational characteristics of commercial vessels tend or sorry, trend towards higher noise levels being tied to higher speeds and size. So vessel size and speed, which in turn connect back to the propeller, are your, your primary drivers of, of underwater noise in, in commercial vessels. And then um, a hull coating, a clean propeller, a clean hull can certainly help to make the vessel as, operate as optimally as possible. Well, also, also more efficiently, of course. Yes, yes, <laughs> certainly. Yes. I can't believe it, but we're almost out of time here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you all for staying for this one session. Um, just to finish off, we'll leave with a little inspiration from our three panelists. What is your vision of ocean noise or for the, your hope for ocean noise in, in 10 years time? Uh, Mark, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Sure, well I hope in 10 years time that the ocean isn't 10 times louder again. Um, according to the IMO, we're going to reduce our global contribution from shipping by minus 3 dB. So that's about one third less, roughly. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to see it reduced by even more than that, maybe 6 dB over the next 10 years. That takes a lot of effort. One thing I do like is, is that if, if you listen to the shipping industry, there's a lot of, of attention being paid to vessel efficiency and reducing greenhouse gases and, and lots of lateral thinking about the ways to do that. So I'm hoping that as, as we do make shipping more efficient and they need to be net zero by 2050, I think, that uh, at the same time, the ocean's going to be a significantly quieter place. Thanks, Mark. Um, for the future, uh, I have a, a couple points. Um, 
I, I really do hope that we see more types of, of new vessels with new propulsion systems and energy saving devices deployed on a wider scale. Uh, I hope that we see alignment uh, between all of the classification societies that currently say this vessel is quiet. I, I hope that in a couple of years, everyone internationally is on the same page about what makes a commercial vessel a quiet commercial vessel. Um, the other two things that I, I love to see is the different slowdown zones that we have in, in Canada and, and the US and, and some other places are being trialed. I hope that these slowdown regions sort of merge and, and, and become uh, again more standardized and um, approachable um, for the, the, the captains and, and, and the vessel owners that are out there. Um, and, and then um, I think one of the themes of, of this talk has been um, a, a hope for more access and more openness to all the data that, that's being collected. And, and I, I won't uh, dive into a, a whole new uh, barrel here by talking about how AI is going to help us with that, but I, I think it certainly will. Um, and, and 10 years from now, hopefully we're looking at a much more accessible underwater noise environment uh, for not just the people who need to analyze the data, but for the people who have genuine interest in it as well. I come to Halifax for this meeting. First thing I did is open my iPhone and then check the weather. Um, so in 10 years time, hopefully we'll come back to Halifax for the Oceans Conference by that time. You can open your iPhone or iPhone 30 Y or whatever <laughs> at that point. And then you're gonna dive in and say, I wanna see what's the sound level in off the coast of Africa. You, you know, you're gonna dive in and say, what's in the normal year look like? Whether this year is louder or, or compared to last decade and last century, uh, even forecasting in the future. And then how do we reduce in the future if it's too loud? Thank you so much. Thank you all for, for being here and for participating. We really appreciate um, you staying throughout and I, I hope you have some sound advice to be able to walk away with and uh, are leaving with more questions than maybe you came in for. And our panelist, Mark, will be here this morning. Uh, Yi is at his, his booth in the exhibition hall and Justin will be around for a little bit after this session of writing questions. But thank you so much. <laughs>